Now, if you are new to the evolution debate, or, like me, are not well versed in the field of biology, then the phrase pharyngeal pouches and bronchial arches might cause your brain to cloud over. I still struggle with the pronunciation, which is never a good start. But fear ye not, I am not of a biological bent. I hope, therefore, that this video will suit numbskulls like me, who concentrate on chemistry and physics at school to the detriment of their knowledge of biology. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is a key argument against intelligent design. Anyone with a modicum of common sense might sensibly state that they need no convincing that life on Earth was not magicked into existence. But if you're going to debate with creationists, then it makes sense to educate yourself on the arguments of both sides. With this in mind, I tried to look at the technical issues of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, so that I could sincerely say that I had researched it to the best of my ability and still stood by the evolutionary argument. So first, the quick and simple version. There are nerves which supply signals from the brain to the muscles of the larynx or voice box. It would be common sense to expect these nerves to follow a fairly direct route if we humans had been created by some super brainy, super organized super being. However, the nerves actually trace a route from the brain down into the chest cavity and back up to the larynx. That sounds like pretty poor design. And when you consider that the same <coughs> design exists in giraffes, then you can see why this can get on creationists' nerves. This was the extent of my knowledge until a couple of weeks ago. But with no further detail presented, than that, it is easy for me to accept that the convoluted path of the recurrent laryngeal nerve is a result of the evolutionary process which has resulted in the path taken by the nerve being incrementally altered as our fishy ancestors evolved through uncountable generations. But these statements alone are not enough to present to someone who believes in a supreme being and by extension believes that we were all created by said being. We need to be able to argue that evolution is the only rational answer to the recurrent laryngeal nerve by exploring further. Please remember that this is my interpretation as a non-biologist, so please check everything for yourself. If you have access to a giraffe, this will help enormously. The key to understanding this issue for me was getting to grips with how the path of the recurrent laryngeal nerve is dictated by the location of the body structures it must negotiate to arrive at its destination. If I could show to my own satisfaction that the path taken by the recurrent laryngeal nerve in the giraffe is dictated by its path through bodily structures that are homologous to bodily structures in much more primitive animals, then this would be sufficient for me to refute any suggestion that the circuitous path presented in the giraffe could possibly be explained away as the result of the pre-planning of some supremely intelligent being working from a blank canvas. Furthermore, any explanation I came up with had to be simple enough for me to understand and simple enough that it could quickly be explained to any creationist on my invite to dinner. Well, the lions don't feed themselves, you know. And so we come to explanation two, which is slightly more detailed. All embryos share common characteristics, which appear to be absurd if each were intelligently designed after its kind. Specifically, they all possess segmented tails and pharyngeal pouches. And whilst in fish, the bronchial clefts which form within the pharyngeal pouches become gill slits, in amphibians, birds and mammals, the ear canal and eustachian tube develop from these clefts. It can be shown beyond reasonable doubt through analysis of both the fossil record and extant species that the bronchial arches which support the gills in early species are homologous to other structures in more complex organisms. That is to say that the forward bronchial arches in jawless fish species are represented by the jaw structures in jawed fish. Also, many fish species have developed the rearward bronchial arches into a second set of jaws, or other teeth-like appendages, within the throat. Fish with these pharyngeal structures include parrotfish, surf perches, kissing gourami, place, and many, many more. And what about us mammals? Well, the lower jaw is formed on a structure derived from the first bronchial arch. The hyoid is a horseshoe-shaped bone embedded horizontally in the base of the tongue. The hyoid apparatus is formed from the second and third bronchial arches, and the larynx, or voice box, forms from elements of the fourth, fifth, and sixth bronchial arches. This is not exhaustive. There are other elements of the head, ear, face, jaw, and throat structures that also derive from the bronchial arches and are homologous to the gill arches in fish species. So we now know that our larynx has a direct relationship to the gill arches of fish. So what? Well, let us see how the gill arches of fish are supplied with blood and nerve controls. It is hopefully clear that the nerves supplying the bronchial arches would be rooted around the blood vessels supplying those same arches. As it happens, it is the nerve supplying the sixth bronchial arch, which is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Over the course of evolution, the neck extended and the heart moved lower into the chest cavity. That's enough for me. But how do the intelligent design apologists address this issue? Argument 1. This is only a problem for design if one assumes design means designed from scratch for each taxon, and if one believes that the designer would necessarily use the shortest distance between two points, etc. Well, so to dismiss evolution, they either claim that their all-powerful, all-knowing being decided his perfect man should be created from the blueprint of a primitive jawless fish, or that his supreme designer does not need to exhibit rationality or logic, or some other ineffable reason is behind it. Anyway, argument 2. 
It's also never been clear to me why imperfect design should refute design. I've complained before about the breakdowns and flaws I've had with computers, but obviously computers are designed. So, evolution is dismissed by stating that their all-knowing, all-powerful being is crap at doing stuff. But let me deal with computers. I assume he's actually talking about PCs, not that the argument differs much. If you're watching this on a PC, then you can be certain that its design is based on the cheapest possible components they can get away with. It's based on a chip that was designed where memory and storage was measured in kilobytes, before flash drives, pen drives, DVDs, CDs, zip drives, 3.5 inch disk drives, before wireless, Bluetooth, infrared, USB or Firewire, before touchscreens, flat screens, windows or mice. But every generation of PC had to be compatible with previous versions for commercial reasons. And so the PC you're using now was not designed from scratch. It has evolved from the original concept. Natural selection, based on evolving technology, marketing, cost, functional needs and fashion, mean that it is the best fit currently available. If you remove just one limitation, cost, Intel, Microsoft, Apple or many others would create a product that would practically never fail. So argument two is an argument for evolution, not against it. Argument three, that other functions of the recurrent laryngeal nerve require the detour. And he quotes from Gray's, we call this an appeal to authority. We could also call it ignorance or deliberate misdirection. I suspect, as is normal, the creationist preachers expect their sheep to accept every lie they dribble out without ever educating themselves. Of course, all this actually says is that the nerve innovates other muscles. But of course, all those other muscles are also evolved from the pharyngeal pouches, the gill slits of our jawless fish. Luckily, I have a copy of Gray's to which I can refer, so let me quote a little. After head folds formation, the stomadium or primitive mouth lies between the maxillary and mandibular parts of the first pharyngeal arch. These are bounded rostrally by the projecting forebrain and cordially by the cardiac prominence. The neck, which will subsequently intervene between the developing jaws and thorax, is absent. It is formed later by modification of the second and subsequent pairs of bronchial pharyngeal arches anteriorly and the neural tube and so might derive structures posteriorly and by descent of the heart notice there are five pairs of pharyngeal arches in mammals numbered one two three four and six by analogy with their evolutionary origin the fifth arch having been lost in the earliest jawless vertebrates agnatha which is the jawless fish the bronchial arches were a uniform series of bars behind the gill clefts however long before the evolution of the terrestrial vertebrates remarkable adaptations occurred structures commonly regarded as the first pair of arches became the upper and lower jaws of the jaw bearing vertebrates etc grays then goes on through many illustrations and accompanying text to describe the evolution of the pharyngeal folds bronchial arches vagus and recurrent laryngeal nerve, etc., from primitive jawless fish to their present human form. And that's it. I hope you excuse my clumsy biology, my more clumsy pronunciation. I sincerely hope you'll check everything I've presented for yourself, and I very sincerely thank you for watching. Now, where did I put that giraffe?